So a quick presentation. So I'm Theo Fidry. Uh, if you can't guess from my accent, I'm French. I live currently in the UK, not for very long, thanks to Brexit. Um, I do mostly PHP, and you can find me on GitHub or Twitter, uh, where I'm relatively active. Uh, I work on some open source projects, Alice, which is a library to generate fixtures, Hamburg and Infection, which are mutation testing libraries, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. PHP is Scoper and Box, which are tools to build files and isolate the code that's shipped in the file. An API platform, which is um, a framework to build modern APIs. Um, so let's start with a show of hands. It's going to be quick. Um, who writes unit tests? Oh, almost everyone. Good. <laughs> <laughs> who follows TDD? Oh, sorry, yeah. Less people, all right. Um, who use a continuous integration system? Nice, expected. Uh, who measure code coverage? Like, yeah, a bit less. And who heard or used uh, mutation testing already? Like, little, some people, nice, cool. All right. So before getting started with mutation testing right away, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about first the problem it solves. Uh, and for that, we're going to talk about software quality. Um, and before talking about software quality, we're going to define it. Um, so according to Marcelo Duarte, who's uh, the author of PHP spec, which if you are not familiar with, is a testing or as a specification tool. Um, so according to him, um, software quality is extend to what software takes into account what matters for the customer uh, and the maintainability of the code source. And if you pay attention to that definition, uh, there's actually two kinds of quality there. Um, the first one is what matters the most for the customer, which is external quality. And the second part, maintainability of the code source, uh, that's uh, internal quality. So, to illustrate it, um, if you don't recognize it, uh, that's a screenshot of Internet Explorer back in the days on XP, uh, Windows XP. If you install all the tools that each installer recommended you to, do, to install, like that's, I mean, that's not good, so that's very poor external quality, obviously, um, but that's a way to illustrate it. Um, so you could define it by the conformity of the user expectations, so reliability, uh, accuracy, um, ergonomics, and design, and other, other metrics probably. Um, but in one word, one word uh, I mean, you could sum some uh, external quality as being the quality perceived by the user. And internal quality, um, so that's a report of Sensor Lab Insight, which is a uh, quality analysis tool. Uh, well, we can always debate uh, what it measures and how it's measured, but we can see like about 20-ish critical uh, issues and over 700 major issues. Like that doesn't really sound good. Um, so internal quality uh, is about the mandability, um, the concision, cohesion, simplicity, clarity, uh, and probably more elements of, of the code. Um, sum it up, it's a quality perceived by the developer. So on one side, so external quality is the uh, quality perceived by the user, and internal quality is the one perceived by the developer. Um, so for this talk, we're going to focus more on internal quality. Uh, external quality could be a whole talk on its own. Uh, and the first question is, should we care? Uh, I mean, to what degree does it matter and how it affects our project? So if we look at this graph, um, says that the project stamina, 
So it's, uh, it's defined by the cumulative functionalities over time. So in red, uh, that's if you don't care about internal quality. So you can see, yes, at first it's relatively uh, easy to add new functionalities, but over time it gets harder and harder. Uh, on, on the other hand, if you do care, okay, it's slower to start, but then the rhythm as w at which you can add new functionalities is relatively constant. So you then have this point, like the payoff line, where two lines are crossing each other, over which it's easier to add functionalities if you added, uh, uh, if you cared about um, quality. In practice, it's usually more matters of weeks rather than months or years. Um, so you can always question this kind of graph, uh, but it does make sense that when you have when I give a quick shot to an idea, like test out something, you just don't want to care about quality because it's going to slow you down. But as soon as you have more s functionalities and it matters that, say, you are working properly, um, well, you're going to need to care because otherwise it's going to be harder and harder. So the idea is the less you care, um, the harder it will get to add new features over time. So that's the pace of the features, but then comes the, the cost of the bugs as well. So on that graph, um, we can see that the cost of the same bug, depending on which time of which phase of development it has been discovered. So you can see a bug costs $100 during development time, and then it just skyrockets to 10K in production. Um, so I mean, you have the sources if you want to check how it's measured, calculated, and everything, and we can always debate about it. Like, in the tooling, there is a whole debate, like, if, if you fancy that. Uh, but again, it, it matches what we can intuitively and in practice encounter that. Uh, for example, let's imagine a payment system. Uh, a user tries to pay. Uh, he, he cannot, like, the system simply refuses. Uh, and another client tries, he gets charged two times. Um, well, in that scenario, you'll have the cost of, well, reporting the bug, finding the bug, fixing it. Uh, it goes through dev to QA uh, until deployment. Uh, you'll probably have to pay back some customers and eventually pay more uh, uh, to the damage them. And even though every, every of those little things uh, are hard to, to measure precisely. Like, it's very easy to tell that all those costs are much, much greater than if you spend a little more time on dev to not have, a, I mean, to fix it uh, during dev time. Um, so to break down the cost, the origin of the cost, well, I told you about it a bit with the example previously, uh, but you have the cost of the implementation, um, debug, uh, when I'm talking of debug and repair here, I, I'm talking after implementation. So if you are debugging and repairing during development time, that's, that's in the implementation. Um, the technical depth, which is the idea that the more complexity you add, uh, the next feature is going to be harder to add. And the cost of delay, um, it's not a cost on its own, it's like more group of different costs, which is um, the lack, the extra cost you paid if uh, you discovered the bug in production rather than in dev. That's the value that you lost there. Um, so to illustrate that, you start from an idea uh, and you build a feature. Uh, that's a feature you expected, so I mean by right feature, but you be wrong in the sense you don't care about quality. So what's going to happen is you're going to have a build cost, fair enough, uh, cost of debug and repair, because you're going to have bugs, uh, and the cost of technical depth. And if you do care about quality, um, then you have a greater build cost, because you're going to mo spend more time on it, uh, to add more tests, for example. You're going to have a very negligent cost of debug and repair, compared to if you uh, didn't care. Uh, and the te technical depth is going to be much lower. Uh, and the way to define the cost of delay would be that difference. Um, not however that it doesn't take into account time at all. 
Um, so the idea about that is the more uh, you, you delay um, and the more expensive it's going to get. Like that's concept of debt. Like you, you, you're going to have to pay it back at some point and the more you wait, well, the bigger the interest are and the more it's going to cost. So obviously the answer is, should you care? Um, well, but then just to what extent, how much should you care? Um, and well, to answer that question, well, we're going to go through uh, how to improve uh, internal quality. So one way to improve it uh, is by adding tests. It's not the only way, but that's the part we're going to focus on. Um, and the issue with test is tests are code. Why is that an issue? Well, because like code, you need to write, you need to make sure they work, you need to refactor them, uh, and you need to maintain them. So tests are expensive, like they are not cheap or they are not free rather, um, and they introduce their own lot of problems. Um, how do you safely refactor the test? How can you trust a test suit? Um, how can you make sure that the rest of the team is writing effective tests? Uh, and the case where you're testing an already written piece of code, how do you make sure that you wrote enough tests so that you can safely refactor that piece of code? So to sum it up, it's the real question behind it is how do you assess uh, the quality of your test? And the idea is that we we have that segment. On one side, you have no test. The other side, maximum number of tests, like infinite. Uh, and you have that red cursor, which is the level of quality. And the more you lean on the left side, no test, you're going to have um, a short-term high velocity, because if you don't add something, you're just going to add or modify something, you're going to have a few files to modify, and that's it. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it without introducing any bug. Uh, but you have little things to change. Whereas, if you have a lot of tests, uh, for one small feature, one small change, you have to change a lot of tests as well. So you're going to have more things to change. So it's obviously going to be slower. You have a better guarantees and things are working as expected, uh, but it's going to be slower. And the idea is, depending on the resources you have at your disposal, uh, your, the, the context of your business uh, and the skills of your team. Like, you just want to know where you are and where you want to go. It's like, depending on, it's just not going to be the same criteria uh, for a startup for who may die in two months if they don't meet the deadline and don't succeed to raise funds. It's an established product for whose image uh, and ensuring a great quality is way more important. So you just, I'm not saying you should be on one side or the other, but more, that's, that part is up to you to decide, like no tool can do that for you. But the question is, how can you know where you are so that you can know where you want to go? Um, so the real question is, how do we assess the quality of the test suit? And to that question, we have common answers. Don't worry, we'll be fine. It's being a bit carefree. Let's be honest. Uh, I'm a ninja rock star. I know my tests are good, which is either arrogant or maybe you might be a genius and that works out for you, but it's probably not the case for the majority. Um, I do TED. I know my tests are good, uh, which is only partly true, because if you do TED, you know your tests are good when you write them, but you can't guarantee for the tests you didn't write and you can't, it's, uh, you can't guarantee that as soon as you change uh, uh, things, and you can't test drive your, your, your test either. Um, code review, which is actually a pretty good answer, uh, it's just very inconsistent and labor intensive. And finally, code coverage, uh, which is, at least in my experience, the uh, um, most common answer. Uh, which is actually completely wrong. Um, the reason being that blind code coverage uh, doesn't tell you what has been tested. Um, 
So if we take that example, so we'll have a counter class with a property count and that count method which we pass a number and then if that number is superior or equal to 10, we increment the number. F simple enough. So we have two tests. Uh, if I pass a number above 10, then it increments the counter and if it's a number below 10, it doesn't increment the counter. So we have two tests. We run the test and, well, we have 100% code coverage. So is it good enough? Um, well, to know that, we can introduce a bug. So we change superior equal to, to superior, and we run the test again. And they pass. So that means our test suit is deficient. So the test we had was not enough. Uh, and the reason being that code coverage doesn't tell you what has been tested. It tells you what has been executed. Like you can see that the report, HTML report, PHP unit, and bottom, so you can't see much here. It's like you have the green lines for the covered lines, and you have the legend at bottom where it says it's executed. Uh, so the number of lines, uh, I mean, the code tested is just a subset of the code executed. So one thing that code coverage can tell you for sure is what has not been tested. If a code has not been executed at all by your test, it cannot be tested. That's the only, thing you, only conclusion you can take from the code coverage. And in our case, we were missing that test. Uh, if you pass 10, it increments the counter. Uh, so that could have been obvious. I mean, obviously, there's cases where it's more complicated than that. But as soon as you add that test, there you go, your test fails. So the idea really is how you can detect that your test suit is deficient. Uh, and the answer is, like we just did, by introducing a bug. And that's the whole idea, whole idea behind mutation testing. Mutation testing is just about um, automating that process. So for the next part, I'm going to talk more in details of what mutation testing is. Um, it's going to be relatively generic because it applies to most mutation testing tools. And then each mutating, mutation testing tool, depending on the language, has some differences. But it's roughly the same thing. Um, so the idea is we create a mutant. And for that, we take the source code, a mutator. That goes through a mutation process. And you get a mutant. Uh, to a more concrete example, we have the example we had before. That modification we had, that's a mutant. Uh, and then each mutation testing tool comes with their own list of mutators. So mutators are the functions that apply the change, um, that generate the mutants. So here you can see, for example, transforming a plus into, uh, into a minus, superior equal to superior, swapping the parents for spaceship operator, or changing the return statement. There is complete list, for example, for uh, infection, which is PHP library. Um, so the idea of the mutation testing tool is, well, it's first going to collect your source files. So that's the very first thing it's going to do. So it has a file collector. And so we have that project, files collector, which is going to pick up counter and foo, which are the two only, only two source files here in that project. And once so tool has those so, um, um, source files. It has this list of mutators. And we pass the source files to mutators, and they're going to generate a list of mutants. So at that point, a mutant is just uh, um, saving a modification it's going to do. So the original file didn't change yet. It just registers a diff that's gonna, that can be applied. So for example, Changing the 10 to 9, uh, decrementing instead of incrementing, uh, changing 10 to 11, changing the sign superior equal to superior. That's all example of mutants uh, that that library will generate. And there's obviously way more. And so we get that list of mutants. And for each mutant, uh, each mutant is going to be sent to a process builder, which is going to start a completely new process in which we're going to apply the mutants. So in that process, we're going to have the mutated code. 
And in that process, we're going to run the test. And from the test, we'll know if the test passes or not. And that's all we want. And the idea is if your test uh, uh, still pass, it means the mutant, which is applying a mutant, is exactly introducing a bug. It means a uh, mutant survive. It means like your test uh, failed to detect that bug. Um, and if, however, the test fails, it means I detec detected that bug. And from that, you can define what we call a mutation score. So we generated a bunch of mutants. A bunch of them are killed. And ideally, what you want is kill all the generated mutants. So the score you want to get is 1 or 100 percent if you change it to percentage. Uh, and the closer you are to 0, um, the worse it is. So back to the original question, how you detect that test suit is deficient? Well, you actually have not one, but two metrics. The first one is code coverage, which tells you what is not tested. And then, for the code, tested code, you have the mutation score that tells you exactly what has been tested there. So the question now is, um, does it actually really work? Because if you saw the mutants, so like they're relatively simple. So the real question is, if you apply that to a real project, will you detect any bug with it? Uh, there is actually a guy that managed to prove mathematically that given a really complex system, if you try to detect all the small bugs in it, uh, you're actually going to end up covering almost all the major bugs you can ever find. So it has been proven that it works. It's not just in practice, we just try them to see. Um, but that's really nice on paper, uh, but it would be boring if it was just on paper, so let's do a demo. I'm not going to do a live demo because I think I'm too unlucky for that to work. Um, so instead, what I do is uh, I use Infection, which is a PHP mutation library, so de facto one, uh, and applied it on Symfony Depends Injection. Or like, yeah, Symfony is a real-life project, relatively complex, so if it works on it, it should work on most projects. So we clone the dependency injection repository. We install dependencies. Uh, we download uh, the infection file, and we download PHP unit because uh, Symfony doesn't have PHP unit as dev dependency. And we configure uh, infection. So as you can see, this configuration is relatively simple here. We just say Okay, that's the first part is for the file collector. We say pick all the files uh, found in the current working directory and exclude vendor on test. Uh, and we just help infection tell which PHP you need to use because uh, it's a bit tricky for it to find. It would, then it would find it automatically if PHP unit was told as dev dependency, but because it's not, like we help him out a bit. And a log file where you get more details. So once you've done that, you can actually start to run infection, and it's going to work. So let's break down the result. You can see here uh, it's running with xdebug enabled. Uh, I'll come to that back to that later. Uh, and it runs the test once to make sure that the tests are passing and to retrieve the code coverage. Um, Obviously, if your tests are not passing while w when we didn't change anything, like something is wrong, it's no point to use, uh, use mutation testing. Um, so then we generate the mutants. So we see there was like almost 150 uh, files, and we generated like 3,500 something mutants. And once we got these mutants, so each dot is applying the mutant in different process and running the test. Uh, and sorry. And if the test passed, then it's green dot. Otherwise, uh, the mutant escaped or it was not covered uh, or it resulted in timeout. And then from that, you get that summary, uh, that breakdown of uh, how many mutants were generated, how many of them were killed, were not covered, and etc. Uh, and what is interesting here is 
mutation score, which is recovered called MSI. Uh, in case you find it slightly confusing, so it's an open issue on infection, try to make that summary a bit easier to read. Uh, but that's the idea, like you run infection and you have all the details. And when it's done, beside the score, because just having the score is not very helpful, like if you run it, okay, some mutant escaped, some not, okay, what's going on? Uh, that's why you have the log report coming in. So it's, in this example, it's a um, text file in which you see the command that has been run with uh, the test, you see the diff that has been applied, and the test output. Um, because you don't necessarily want, I mean, you can guess it's going to be relatively slow. I mean, at least an order of magnitude slower than just running your test. So if you do a pull request, obviously you don't necessarily want the CI to run the whole uh, mutation testing the whole library again uh, on your project. So you have, you can find that comment in, uh, on the documentation, PHP CS Fixer use the same thing. It's just to apply uh, in fiction to only the changed files because that's all you need really like you do one time on the whole project uh, to get the results but then what you're really interested in is how it evolves with the changes you are making and that's it for the demo um, it's that simple you don't have more configurations to do like just create that file and run it. And then it just, you inspecting the results, see if that makes sense or not. There's going to be false positives, like bugs introduced that are not covered, you didn't, don't really want to take care of, uh, but that's really up to you to decide. So when I saw that, uh, when I first encountered mutation testing, I was like starting to be really curious about that project. Uh, and my first question is, I mean, is that new? Uh, like, I never heard of it before. And it turns out that we were already talking about the technique back in the 70s. So it's not used. I mean, it's, it's not new. It's not widely used. So what's, what's the catch? Like, it's bound to be something, right? Um, all right, it turns out there is a few issues with it. Um, the first one is maturity issue. Uh, even though it's getting better and better, uh, at the level of the uh, IT industry, there's not enough tests. And mut mutation testing is for your tests. It's to a way to test your tests, among other things. So obviously, if you don't have any tests in first place, mutation testing is completely useless. Um, there's still that integration problem with depending on how long that takes to run, how you integrate it with your CI and stuff. Uh, I think it's getting better there. Uh, and the idea is what I recommend is to run it in your CI with just the file modified. Uh, but the real core issue is actually a technical problem, which is it's a brute force technique. Why it being a brute force technique is a problem? Uh, it's a problem because if you have n number of tests and m number of mutants, you're going to end up running n uh, by m mutants. So to take an example, with our demo, we had seven, almost 700 tests, takes almost 30 seconds to run. We generate uh, 3,500 mutants. So that ends up being 2.5 million tests, which is going to take 50 something hours to run, like, <laughs> I, you can guess I didn't wait 50 hours to get the results for that demo. Uh, so there is optimization strategies, like mutate only the covered code. If the code is not covered, it's not tested. You don't need to try to induce a bug to see if your test suit is going to pick it up. It doesn't even execute that part of the code. Uh, incremental analysis, uh, which is actually not supported yet by, uh, I mean, it's partly supported by infection, but the idea is like you don't run the uh, uh, analysis on, on your whole code base all the time. But you can, you can already filter with the command I showed you before. Um, parallelism, because why run the tests all one by one 
Uh, it's like it's better as they are starting new processes, it's better to execute them in parallel. Uh, and the problem of equivalent mutant, the idea of equi equivalent mutant is you may have several mutants that end up changing the code in a way that it actually gives the same results. So if like two mutants give the same result, you actually want to apply only one because running the test again a second time for it is useless. Uh, so there are some studies have been there uh, that have detected that on average mutation testing library generates 30% of uh, useless mutants. Um, and obviously the less mutants you have, uh, the less tests you have to run. So the first test is going to be. Uh, infection doesn't have yet an issue to, uh, uh, a way to tackle that. But there will be one performance improvement to do. Uh, and different levels of, levels of requirements. Um, so the idea is you have some part of your projects that are very sensitive. Like you want, you want to uh, make sure that it works for sure. And then some parts like I don't know, a kind of report that's only for you. Uh, or s I mean, there's some parts that you don't necessarily care if it's nearly as tested. And the ideas of uh, those level, different levels of requirements will be for the important parts, you make sure there's a lot of mutators enabled. It's going to be fully checked. And the parts you care less, while either you don't test them at all or you just test them uh, in, in a more uh, flexible way with less mutants. So infection does implement a few of those optimization strategies. Uh, and in the example of dependency injection component, it takes only 10 minutes. Like, you can see there's a big increase. Like it's, we go from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. It's not nothing. Uh, but one, it's for the whole code base, which you are not likely to do that all the time. You want to do that only on the diff. And it's still much better than 53 hours. Um, so infection is still relatively young, like it has ba it's barely one year old. For open source projects, it's extremely young. Um, there's some future wor more work to do on it, uh, adding more uh, test framework to it. Right now it supports PHP spec and PHP unit. It would be nice to have conception, Behat, and maybe a couple of others. Tackling the problem of equivalent mutants, uh, and other performance optimization could be done. Uh, and that granular configurations I've talked about, uh, we have partially that already. You can uh, each mutate, you can define profiles which are going to pick the list of mutators you're going to apply. So you can play with that a bit, but you cannot change that configuration for only a part of your project and another part of your project yet. So to write it up, um, the good part for me is it gives you feedback on your test. So that's the very first thing. Like regardless of how much confidence you have on your test, uh, how highly or poorly you think of yourself, like you run that on the test and you'll have a good idea of what those tests are worth. Um, it's a way to test your test with very little defaults. Um, it's automatic. You see there's pretty much nothing to do. Clone the project, install infection, configure it, and there you go. Uh, discover dead code. So I don't mean by dead code here like, oh yeah, that line is never executing. No, I mean more like useless test. Let's say you have 10 tests to test something, and you realize after running infection that if you had only two of those tests, uh, you get the same results. It means you had eight tests that were literally useless. Uh, and test our code, so the less code there is, the better. Um, so it's a really good way to help you to refactor your test as well. Um, the not so good parts, uh, it can be a bit slow. Uh, there is a handful of, of young libraries. There was only infic Hamburg and Infection, and we deprecated Hamburg in favor of Infection because it was its clear successor and it's no point to have competition there. Uh, it's still relatively hard to write complex mutants. So you saw the list of mutants, it's really simple operations. It will be really interesting to be able to do a few more in, uh, intelligent things. For example, you have a regex, like to change only a few elements, but like not randomly. Uh, just try to be a bit more smarter there. Um, and 
uh, last but not least, side effects with integration tests. So you must keep in mind that what that tool is going to do is introduce a bug in your test suite. So if your tests are talking to a database or manipulating your file system, you must be ready for the consequences. I highly recommend you to run it on Docker, but let's say, for example, you have a test that randomly deletes a directory. And the bug introduced redirects the directory deleted from being a directory you know in the project from being the root. You are not going to be happy with what's going to happen. So obviously, it's very unlikely that it happens. The most likely outcome you'll ever get is uh, actually running out of memory if you allow PHP to have a limited amount of memory. Uh, but if you're talking with database, it's the same thing. It's just, in general, safer if you have integration tests uh, uh, run by infection to run them in Docker container. At least you're safe. You don't have to worry about the side effects at all. Uh, and if you're interested about, more interested about the topic, uh, I have that repository, mutation testing, uh, where I keep tracks of diverse resources and all the tools in other languages as well. So you can check out the level of maturity in other languages as well. And there's some research papers too. Thanks very much. Uh